something the matter? I should hope not, after the time we spent together. My spirits are thoroughly lifted. Like any good Baldur's Gate 3 player, I take my adventuring very seriously. I always keep a shovel somewhere on my person for buried treasure, which is what I like to call digging up corpses for a nice chat about what it's like to be bone meal. I keep every weird bit of bric-a-brac I find neatly organised in my traveller's chest, just in case I meet someone interested in seeing my collection of severed heads and face paint kits. I anxiously debate the morality of quick loading when a dice roll doesn't go my way, only to accidentally die in combat so I can try again with a plus one d4 bonus from Guidance that I forgot to apply the first time around and totally meant to do anyway so it's not like cheating or anything. And of course, I have diligently pursued romantic endeavours for a full and thorough exploration of the character work that the game has to offer. I don't think I've ever had a confidant quite like you. It's only fair to the devs that made the game, eh? They put a lot of work into creating a lot of horny scenarios. And I'm not talking about tieflings here. Oh, maybe I am, depending on your relationship with Karlak, eh? So far, I have bedded a devil, an incubus, and a, uh, tentacled pal that earned me a surprise trophy and scarred the rest of my camp indelibly. Scenes so explicit that I can only show you Dave reacting to them. Goodness me. But this video isn't simply about what a prolific seductress I am with the creatures of Faerun. No, it is about my main squeeze, Shadowheart, and my sacred duty as a player to ask her for a little kiss every time I'm in camp. Yes, it is my duty, but it's also my honour. I made it my singular mission to get kinetic with the cleric as wholesomely as possible in my Baldur's Gate 3 playthrough. You see, I am in love. I mean, my character is in love with Shadowheart, and their shared passion for killing weaklings and hanging out in dark places makes their love story as beautiful as it is bloody. Ooh. Yet, this is not a happy video, dear viewers. Oh no. For Baldur's Gate 3 is as unruly as it is captivating, and the natural chaos that I'd embraced throughout my gameplay finally came back to bite me. To shame me to make a fool of me in a way I'd never experienced before at the most pivotal moment of me laying my sweet moves down with my scary wife. But first, to understand the full depths of my woe, and quite how this happened, we have got to take a wider look at all the joys Baldur's Gate 3 has tucked away in the illusory walls of its setting. I grew up on a healthy diet of fantasy games. Like, playing them, not eating them. From Champions of Norath, to Drakan the Ancient's Gates, to Gauntlet Dark Legacy, and then Elder Scrolls and beyond, Baldur's Gate 3 was always going to worm into my brain like a Mind Flayer tadpole. I just didn't quite prepare for how deeply it would get under my skin. On a personal level, it brings back all this nostalgia of running co-op through Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance with my dad, only with the in-game party of four acting like a physical manifestation of all the warring opinions we used to have about who gets the bastard sword, or the bee sword, as we had to call it when my mom heard us playing and had some stern opinions to share on 15th century naming conventions. But where those other games are wrapped in distinct memories of nights spent on beanbags, captivated by the TV, Baldur's Gate 3 throws a displacer beast amongst my nostalgia. It's video game memories, yes, but it is also the dining table lit by lamplight, with the smell of old cardboard wafting through the air as we cracked open another tabletop adventure. It's three hours on a Sunday afternoon memorising a paperback rulebook and still getting half of it wrong when we actually got to playing. It's my dad's hand-painted miniatures I'd watched him spend all winter making look perfect to play just one game with. All the evenings spent crying with laughter with my friends as we plot to sneak a frog into a lord's pants to disrupt a banquet. Surprisingly, it worked very well. Ah! Baldur's Gate 3 is a tabletop player's dream, giving life to the Dungeons & Dragons world I've inhabited that millions have inhabited for years, whilst managing to capture the vast magnitude of nonsense that happens in it simultaneously. Stop this thing! It distills the feeling that you're being guided by an invisible DM as the narrator's silky voice embellishes your inner monologue. Every time the game offers up class-specific, race-specific, or experience-specific dialogue, you can almost feel that DM jumping through hoops to let you roleplay your character in ways that you may have never thought of otherwise. 
playing as a drow made for loads of opportunities to relish the suffering of other struggling characters, for example, as well as just say cool stuff about my beloved Underdark. Do you have a moment to talk about our demon web pit lord and spider saviour, Lolf? Tabletop games, and D&D games in particular, are chaotic gatherings of creative weirdos at their heart. And that is the essence that is pumping through every shadow-cursed vein of Baldur's Gate 3. That the game itself is so weird is not just charming, it is its greatest strength. Really think about the narrative you're plunged into here. You've got a wriggling little grub in your brain that's been inserted by a race of evil space squids, and it's up to you to find a cure that'll fix it. If we just look at Act 1 alone, you'll be offered antidotes from a cosy northern hag that claws your eye out for a look at your insides, and an enthusiastic bard come amateur surgeon with similar ocular fixations. You can beseech a goblin priestess to take a look around your brain, or climb into a living machine made for feasting on tadpoles. Or you could ignore everything and wander around with the little guy waiting on an illithid transformation that'll give you a betentacled glow-up. It's not just the breadth of choice, but the absurdity of the situation that makes Baldur's Gate 3 such a revelation to play. It is totally unafraid to get as weird as possible in a way that feels incredibly authentic to players' own experiences with the tabletop game. And, as I found out during my Shadowheart courtship, that weirdness, aka that freedom to deviate from the norm and create your own fun, isn't just in the cutscenes written into the game, either. My character's name is, inventively, Ashen. It's like Ash, but there's an E-N on the end. Get it? She's a loth-sworn dry rogue who left Menzo Baranzan for information and treasure to bring back to the Underdark to better serve her god, after a life spent raiding underground tunnels on the back of her riding lizard in search of lost relics. I mean, you have to give your D&D character a little bit of backstory flavour, right? I met Shadowheart early on in my journey. She's a cleric of the Lady of Lost Shah, naturally a big suffering enthusiast, and finds comfort in both darkness and pointy, pointy words. You ass. Yeah, I guess I deserve that. To me, it made perfect sense that the two of us should pair up romantically. I mean, I'm not not gonna go for the rude hot goth lady, am I? What started out as frustration at her inability to open up soon turned into softness at understanding why. And I have been kicking my feet and giggling at each interaction between us both since. I'm probably enamoured with her so much as her story is the most compelling to me. That of figuring out who you are inside versus who everyone thinks you should be. The warring goddesses of Dark Shar and Moonlit Saluna that intertwine around her narrative arc are this swirling vortex of femininity, rage, and beauty shrouded in night. And yet, at the centre of it all, she's really just a softie who loves night orchids and animals, despite her whole I'd rather be chewing on pins than talking to you vibe. Her navigation through surety and vulnerability is inspiring. But most of all, she is a rude, hot goth lady. Come on. And so we get to the part of the story where the salacious action goes down. Despite my earlier claims of sleeping with all manner of beasts, with Shadowheart's approval might I add, that came far later in the game. It was only when I finally reached Worms Crossing, right before the city of Baldur's Gate, that I realised the opportunity was there to, uh, you know. When two spooky ladies with worms for brains love each other very much. To be fair, I only realised this because two workers at Charesse's Caress, you can figure out what type of establishment this is by its name, I hope, straight up asked to boink. Um, what does boink mean? And Shadowheart spelled it out very clearly that she wanted first dibs. Ooh. So I rushed back to camp. I mean, I headed back to camp very calmly and did what I always do before ending the day. I dropped miscellaneous trinkets into my traveller's chest of severed heads and face paint kits. What I soon realised, however, was that in putting all my things away, I accidentally toggled one of the aforementioned face paint kits that can only be removed with a long rest. No bother, I thought. I'm about to sleep anyway. And so I laid my weary head down to rest for but a brief moment in the hopes my affliction would disappear. Alas, it was then that my dear sweet shadow heart decided she'd like to uh, get some midnight swimming lessons. Not like this, shadow heart. Not like this. Take off your clothes. 
I learned the hard way you have to get to morning to remove facial status effects during a long rest. And somehow water doesn't wash off your painterly handiwork no matter how much you splash around. So this is what I was left with for the most touching moment of my character's journey. Literally and figuratively. Clothes off, face paint on, as I question my all too eager side quest of romancing Shadowheart and how this is the price I had to pay. It left me with just one question. Did the game really have to call me out like this? And really, whatever the answer is, I'm glad it did. It's a funny aside that takes the beautifully authored story of Shadowheart and beams it through the lens of personal creation. Just like when I played a one-shot with the usual Dungeons & Dragons rules, but our characters were actually all gerbils. To be fair, it was quite a lot like Baldur's Gate 3, if you equate the illicit transformation with a far furrier one. My point is that the chaos of Baldur's Gate 3 is a truthful representation of the role-playing at the heart of tabletop campaigns. You could argue that it's the wealth of choices you can make, and each of their rippling consequences. The rattle of customizable D20s that bounce around their own digital dice box. The turn-based moments where you pause and assess a scene for high ground bonuses, and quickly sift through weapon wheel highlights akin to pages and pages of spell notes. I know I've got something nasty in here somewhere. All of those things work together as a whole to give Baldur's Gate 3 truly enchanting tabletop-inspired gameplay. But it's the chaos, the weirdness, me! and the personal flubs, What's intimate the moments ruined by accidental clown face makeup, for example, that capture the reality of Dungeons & Dragons' specific high fantasy fun better than anything. The tabletop game has always been about creating your own adventure with a group of friends, using the rules as a skeleton for the flesh that is unique to your journey. You'll all know the main beats of a story thanks to the accompanying rulebook, but the way you get through it will be all of your own imagination. And of course, very chaotically. Baldur's Gate 3, then, is so perfect because that sculptable chaos is the beating heart at the centre of your playthrough. Creating a world where random encounters make sense while still retaining emotional stakes is the real high-level charm spell cast by this wonderful, beautiful, brilliant little game. And why I'm still crushing on it after nearly 100 hours exploring. Well, it's either the game or Shadowheart, but the whole clown thing really put my fixation into perspective. A little misdirection. Couldn't resist. Chaos reigns then, hey? There's my little love letter to my Baldur's Gate 3 experience, and to the game itself that I plan to write many more stories with. Who are you romancing? What is your favourite random experience you've had? Let me know in the comments below. As always, give the video a like if you enjoyed this, subscribe to stay up to date with the world of PlayStation, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.